his own decision to convict the former high school football star of sexually assaulting a four-year-old boy. He says every day he thinks about Kelly, who is now trying to get his conviction overturned because of new evidence. But there is someone else he thinks about as well. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison in 2014, but finally a publicized trial. 18-year-old Greg Kelly, the Cedar Park, Texas football star on his way to a full scholarship, was found guilty of sexually assaulting two four-year-old boys, a crime he didn't commit. It's just the sense of hopelessness. It's like you're trying to do everything you can. I mean, what can else can you do other than get on the top of a mountain and just say, hey man, I didn't do it. From football standout to recovering drug addict, and now motivational speaker, Northern Kentucky's own Zeke Pipe, He's had quite a journey, a mission to turn his life around. Northern Kentucky football star is in trouble again. Zeke Pike was pulled over Saturday in Fort Wright, the day before his birthday. Police say the 25-year-old was under the influence, and they say they found marijuana in his car. Pike, who graduated from Dixie Heights in 2012, has a history of run-ins with the law. He played football at Auburn, Louisville, and Murray State, but left all three following an arrest. And I, I was going to kill myself, bro. Like, I was 100% yeah fully prepared that night to end my life like that was it bro. i had to either decide to stand in front of everyone i know my mom my friends my girlfriend and and just say that i did something i didn't do or go fight for the truth the purpose of, of bringing messages and stories of high level individuals is to let the people out there understand that the shit you're going through right now, it will pass. Welcome to the Give Back Podcast. I'm Zeke Pike. I'm here with my partner and co-host, Greg Kelly. And the whole point of this podcast is to bring real purpose back to the podcast world by giving stories about comeback, giving stories of, of the underdog who makes it out of the fight, and giving stories of real pain that have turned into purpose in life. And you know we're, we're super excited to have this opportunity to share not only our stories and some of the things that we've been through in our lives, but share the stories of other people. And uh, we both have great networks, great connections, and some really big time guests that are in store to bring you the real, raw, authentic stories of their lives, where they've been and how they've gotten to where they're at now. And so I couldn't be any happier, couldn't be any more proud to do this alongside you, Greg Kelly. And so I'm super excited to be here, man. Awesome. Thanks, Zeke, man. I tell you what, getting to this moment to be able to do this, to do this podcast, I think it's something very special. I know that um, I had expressed this to you earlier and, and just to our audience that have been tuning in. I would express that both of us, me and Zeke, had to get into a place of just complete peace in our life before we could go out and do something meaningful into the world. I think, um, you know, moving forward, we I'm super excited to be able to do this and uh, continue to, to do something great in this it's, world. It's funny because I hit you up, what, June 4th? We were just looking yeah. at it. June 4th, 2021, um, on a plane and on a Delta flight. Mm-hmm. And had experienced many ups and downs in my life at this point in time, right? From from being molested at a young age to, again, going through the entire recruitment process um, to to struggling with drugs and alcohol to losing people who were very close to me in my life, yeah. experiencing trauma at the, at the at the core, experiencing grief at the core. And when I'm sitting on this Delta airplane and I'm watching this this outcry documentary and I'm listening to your story and I'm watching this documentary, the only thing I could think to myself is everything that had happened to me in my life that was a direct result of my own self-sabotage I deserved, yeah. right? And when I'm looking at the story and I'm watching the story, I'm like, man, this dude didn't deserve any of it, right? And we're like, same, same platform, same, same story in the sense of like, bro, we're both chasing this dream of playing college football and playing in the NFL. Like that was the dream that we had. And, you know, again, our paths took different different courses, right? Mm -hmm. But ultimately when I'm sitting on that plane watching that that doc that docuseries, I couldn't help but be like, man, I gotta reach out to this dude, right? And there was something in my heart at that point in time where I was like, we're gonna do something special. Me and this dude's story, 
it meshes in a way that we're gonna do something special. This is three years ago, right? Mm. We just looked at the message and it's like, hey, we need to get together. We're gonna do something amazing for the world, right? In the roundabout way. I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely curious over the last couple years of your life, right? A lot of people have, may have seen the out, outreach or the outcry documentary, but over the last three years specifically, like, what is what is your, your what is your what is your journey been? Because again, at the time, like, you're you're launching Tomahawk targets, you're you're, you're getting ready to start your own business, yeah. And you know, I think you were at a point in your life where you were trying to figure things out too, right? And so. I'm genuinely curious, like, you know, how has, how has things been over the last couple of years of your life outside of the Outcry documentary, outside of, you know, everything that you experienced from, from a result of that documentary and really going through what you went through, but what has life been like? I know you're kind of experiencing some, some new, exciting, exciting things and just where are you at? Yeah. You know, I, it's so crazy, man. Like, I think if you, if I can wrap it up in a, a nutshell that, my life, it seems like every corner, it's something different. It's like, I've really figured out that life's just about a bunch of chapters. And um, as much as I, I, I want to like be able to focus on one thing, I feel like another thing's coming at me. And at one point, I, I was so gung ho about living life and living fully free that I was just like starting to stretch myself thin. So that's how much I appreciate freedom now after the fact of being exonerated. So if you ask me like, what do I appreciate the most? It's just literally being able to wake up to be free. Yeah. And so what my life has been like now, it's been so crazy, you know, and we'll get into, you know, the dynamics of my story and your story. But um, what I started, of course, was a business. I, well, let's just go ahead and start with that. I married my eighth grade sweetheart, Gabri. Uh, we'll have her on the podcast uh, eventually later on down the road. But um, phenomenal woman, man. I She stuck by my side through my whole injustice. Um, so we had, I married her shortly after I got exonerated. Um, and then after that, I had started a small business that I didn't know was gonna skyrocket and just like pick up in so much speed. Uh, and it really started from the pandemic in reality. Like uh, I'm in the ax throwing industry. So I started a company called Tomahawk Targets. And what it is, is just that we manufacture targets that people can enjoy in their backyards. Um, uh, we have 17 different type of uh, I, you know, designs of targets. Um, and COVID really excelled people to buy online, right? Yeah. E-commerce boomed. So these venues started shutting down. The ax throwing industry, the sport of ax throwing was already skyrocketing. So I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna tinker around in my garage and bought some, you know, lumber from Home Depot. Yeah. And, and I was like, okay, cool. So I did it and I, I posted it and my documentary hadn't come out yet. And so I had a little bit of a following and people saw my story of me throwing axes in my backyard with my father-in-law and they thought it was really cool and they had heard of axe throwing they never tried it so there's like hey i got all this time to kill in my my house so um i order a, a target from greg can you make me one so i um uh, i end up you know making one for myself and then i had all these people interested in them and then next thing you know let's just the rest was history i started a website and people started ordering and now here we are now you know it's it's provided a, a great income for myself for the business, I've got employees now, and it's slowly growing, and and so that's something I have going for me. I got to play football again. Um, um, you know, football was stripped from me in my whole story, and I got to go play collegiate football for one year. Um, and ultimately, man, like if I think back on everything, it's just I'm really enjoying freedom, and it's it's been a blessing. Yeah, and man, I was just like, it's crazy because I think, you know, when I look back on my life, right, what you were accused of. What you were accused of doing was something that for for somebody who's been a victim, for somebody who's been molested as a child yeah. and has went through that, the 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 hate and frustration and and just anger I had towards towards that person, right? To think of how disgusting, how just awful and evil of a person someone can be. And to watch that docu-series and, and think to myself, like, to be labeled as that and that not be the case, I mean, like, that's a that's a scary thing to be labeled as, right? And so, absolutely, you know, that was, like, the first thing for me when I'm watching this docu-series, I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm almost triggered by it, right? Because, again, in a way where when I hear anything along the lines of, you know, molestation it, it's triggering right like it it, it it of course brings back that 
that that that thought of that experience that I've had in my own life. But what what was that like? Like again, you're a kid that's like you know doing everything right in your life, and all of a sudden you don't get accused of like stealing. You don't get accused of you know doing drugs. Like you get accused of something that is almost like one of the worst possible things that you could ever be accused of. Yeah. What, like what, I'm just genuinely curious, like what was going through your mind at that point in time, like really going through your mind? Yeah, um, you know, I'm not gonna dumb it down. I mean, it was absolute hell. I mean, it's absolute hell. If you can just imagine being labeled that, What's so crazy is that they, my own like media, my own local news was painting me out to be a monster, right? Mm. So in, in 2013, I was falsely accused of, of a crime I didn't do, you know, living in an in-home daycare um, where my best friend's mother ran and both of my parents were medically ill. And, and you know, I had, to, I had to go there and live there because it was close to the high school. And so um, I was just an all around, just a football player, ready to go to college, just playing ball, going to school, I had a girlfriend, just, just a normal, you can just think of a normal high school kid, that's what I was, you know? I can't say normal maybe because I, I focus so much on sports and excelling in that, but that's just who I was. Right. And so um, knowing that, knowing who, what my identity was in that, um, the only adversity I probably ever saw in my life, right, or any type of pain in my life, was um, you know going into the fifth quarter in overtime football games. I had coaches that were really great and in instilling discipline, um, just a warrior's mentality, a warrior's heart into us. That was we used to do like these um, these like these Navy SEAL or like Army Ranger Hell Weeks in like yeah. football program right in the football period, and I I loved that because I loved the competition and so I was a naturally competitive person. Um, but being labeled something like that that day that came around when I got accused of that. Um, it's like, it's like, I try to put, I try to put the emotions and the words into it, but it's like something happening to you outside of your control, because all you want to do is speak the truth. All you want to do is get down to the nitty gritty of like, Hey, I'm trying to prove to you that like, I didn't have anything to do with this. I didn't do this. But then again, it's just excelling and intensifying as the media, right? The local news puts your mugshot out there and, and you getting painted a monster that man the media had lied so much about me during the whole thing just you know they get clickbait they want to yeah. get their ratings and so if you want to talk about emotions on how i was feeling is that there was a lot of like walking through hell and a lot of just like trying to maintain hope that the truth was going to come out and there was a lot of numbing as in a sense that like i just try not to think about it so much so and but then again it's like as the as I, the hell got worse through my whole situation of a whole lot of nothing during an investigation to go into trial and getting wrongfully convicted by the jury of my peers and then having to go into prison and then spend, you know, get sentenced to prison for 25 years was absolutely no evidence, evidence against me other than the testimony of a child, the victim, yeah. right? Um, all of this is just bang, 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 just hitting me like tidal waves. And I'm in a sense, just growing stronger just to see the next day. And so just a mixture of that to like just numbing and not thinking about it, but then also like the past experiences of having to get through things um, in football and, and in sports um, and but with both of my parents. I mean, dude, I mean, you gotta get strong to understand that your mom's got brain tumors, right? And your dad just had a stroke. And so you're just getting hit over and over and over again. And I think I have to really, really give a testament to me just making good decisions to just keep fighting. Yeah. And I think that's a whole lot of it, man. I feel like if you ask me, you know, what does it take to get through pain? It's just like, if you, like I said, if you're walking through hell, just keep on walking. Like you got, you're gonna get stronger. Your mind's gonna get more fortified. But the reality is like, <clears throat> it's so fucking cliche to say that too. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's, 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 that's the reality is like, it's easy. It's easy to say to somebody like, oh, you're going through hell right now. Just keep on going because there has been times in my life where it was like I was going through hell, right? And like that, that was always kind of the cliche thing that is is said, right? Like everything's gonna happen, everything happens for a reason. I don't believe everything's, that, everything's gonna be okay. Yeah. Just keep going, God's yeah. gonna work it. And, and again, these are all great things that like right. you wanna believe, you wanna have hope, but like in that moment, dude, like call it what it is, right? You know, when I was standing in front of a judge and the judge looked at me, he's like, you got four years, you're facing 15 years, we'll see you back in September. Like, 
Yeah. I, I knew, like, look, I'm sitting in this courtroom. I'm guilty, yo. I'm guilty. I'm a drug addict. I'm, I'm, I'm a junkie. I'm burnt out. I blew every opportunity that I had. Like, I, I deserved it. You're sitting in front of a judge, and the judge looks at you and is like, bro, you're guilty, like, and you're not. Like, there's rage, bro. There's anger. There's, there's, you're, you're, you're mad. Like, I'm, I want, I'm genuinely curious. How do you handle that? Like, I, I was mad at myself. I had so much hate towards myself, bro. Yeah. Because I knew what I did to deserve that. Like, yeah. You have to have so much anger, and like, the juries, the, 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 the district attorneys, the judge. The prosecuting attorneys, yeah. like, did you ever see? Did you ever see? Um, did you ever see? Like, I didn't know any of this until like I was actually in prison, and I was sent these things, like these newspaper clippings, uh, from my family, um, because I had said like, hey, send me all these newspaper clippings. I'd love to keep it in a scrapbook because eventually I'm gonna write a book, and I want to just kind of collect everything. But there was actually newspaper clippings that people were sending me of like my looks that I was giving to the DA. And like to like the jury and like just like you could see the like the lifelessness from my face as I was going through just the court proceedings. And when you put it that way, like, you know, sitting standing in front of a judge and in front of a jury that's looking at you like you're a monster, like the jury literally like when I looked at the jury, the people were just giving me like like disgusting looks. I'm just like I'm sitting there and it, it, if you ask me, it's like. It's just the sense of hopelessness. It's like you're trying to do everything you can. I mean, what can else can you do other than get on the top of a mountain and just say, hey, man, I didn't do it. Like, right. what the hell, you know? Um, so when you talk about anger and unforgiveness and rage, it starts bottling up inside of you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, at a surface level, people think that, like, all that just needs to stay at a surface level. It doesn't. You can actually use that to step back and I think I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that I was the type of person to really tap into like how I was feeling and what was going on and just say, hey, these are, just, these are my emotions right now. I just gotta breathe. And I think small little wins over and over again, just like I said, it wasn't like, I wasn't in this position to say, you know what, like everything's gonna be okay. When I was going through trial, I wasn't going like, everything's gonna be okay, I'm right. happy. No, I'm pissed off, I'm angry. But I just gotta breathe for a second. I gotta see what the next move is, because quitting wasn't wasn't for me. It just wasn't in my blood, dude. Right. I don't know what it is. I I, I can't explain. I'm not. Maybe I'm not smart enough to explain, right? How 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 I decided not to quit. And you want to go talk about going into the next phase of getting wrongfully convicted and going into prison. I think that me choosing to figure out what faith is was really important to me. If I look back on it, that was the most monumental thing I could have ever done because I've seen people kill themselves in prison. I've seen people of faith even kill themselves in prison. I've seen people die in prison. I've seen people killed and murdered in prison for the charge I was in there for. And thank God that that wasn't me, right? right? And I, maybe there was a hedge of protection over me. Yeah. Maybe, maybe in a sense that, you know, you said earlier, you know, everything happens for a reason. I don't necessarily believe that to be fully true. I think some people do things absolutely for no reason, right? And I think it's, but then again, I think very monumental things happen for a reason. Um, and so I think, you know, when you talk about like in that moment at my age at 19, all the anger and rage and unforgiveness, I didn't know how to deal with it other than just take the next step. And I think that when you ask me that, that's what I think of. You get sentenced to three and a half years. And, and I'm curious of this because March 6, 2016, I have been up for like six days, bro. Like yeah. in a fog, Xanax, cocaine, alcohol. And I, I was going to kill myself, bro. Like I was a hundred percent yeah, fully prepared that night to end my life. Like that was it, bro. Like I had, I had been kicked out of every school, you know, Auburn kicked me out, Louisville kicked me out, Murray State kicked me out. My parents kicked me out. I'm yeah. sitting in, on my back porch with the handgun on my lap and I'm saying, this is it, bro. I'm ready to end my own life. On my way to go kill myself that night, I looked in my rear view mirror and there was red and blue flashing lights. When I woke up in jail, I was almost relieved to be there because I knew God spared me because that night I was gone, bro. 
you know, I came to 48 hours later after being in a complete fog, right? Seizing, shitting all over myself, bro. Yeah. You know, begging, just like, yo, give me a shower. Let me call my mom and dad. You know how it is in there, bro. You push that button in the shower, like it doesn't stay on, you know? And so I'm here trying to clean myself off. I get over to the phone to call my mom and dad and I, I legitimately didn't realize, like I hadn't spoken to my mom and dad in like six, seven, eight months because they were like, look, we cut, we're cutting you off. Like until you want to change or want to help yourself, like we're not doing anything. When I got to jail, bro, I was legitimately relieved because I felt like God saved my life. I wasn't happy to be there. I knew I deserved to be there. I knew that what I did was wrong. I I mean, dude, five DUIs, bro. I knew I deserved to be there. Have you ever had that thought of suicide, bro? Like when you were in there? You know, I think I got to to the part of suicide. I think I've contemplated the part of just maybe not waking up and me being okay with it, you know? I think it'd be easier not to wake up than wake up and see those bars every day, you know? And that happened probably for the first couple of months of, of being in jail. Um, I mean, did you see any hope? Like, like be realistic. Like when you're going through it, right? You're sitting in there and you're like, they've already convicted me. I got 25 years, Yeah. 25 years, bro. Like, yeah, you're appealing it and this and that. But at this point, the, ju- the court system already failed you, bro. Yeah. Your own lawyers already failed you. Yeah. Like at, at this point, they just gave you 25 years and they're like, look, you never, you're not seeing your family again for 20, you're going to, you're going to be 50 years old when you get out, bro. Mm-hmm. So I think when you talk about, let's talk about hope. And a lot of times when we think about hope, it's like, can you see an end? And if you can see an end, the other side, at the end of the tunnel, yeah. if you see that light, that means there's hope, you know, there was no hope when I first got put into yeah. prison. I promise you, it was darkness. Yeah. Like I, it was so crazy is that like in the state of Texas, you can convict somebody of super aggravated sexual assault of a child, which carries between 25 to 99 years in prison, absolutely day for day. Um, you can convict somebody of that solely on just a testimony of, of, anybody. of just anybody. Yeah. No evidence or anything, right? When you talk about hope, seeing the other side of the tunnel, the seventh day, whenever I got those, like those handcuffs, clicked on me now there was a other side of that jail wall that I had no idea there was a world out there that I did not know anything about so if you want to talk about hope I didn't have hope I had fear Mm. I had fear I was so scared out of my mind this time are you still in the county I'm in the county and so how long did were you in county for I was in county for um Cause I'm assuming you I were mean, in which, county up until they said, okay, yeah. 25 years. And then they right. wake you up, pack it up. You're going, you're going to the farm, yeah. wherever you're going. So, I mean, which time? Because like, man, I went to, I was, I was in county like for. When you got the final yeah. sentence and they said, you got 25 years, bro. Yeah. Yeah. At some point in from that, you're like going, you know, you're at the county, Williamson County, wherever you're at, at the county jail. And they're like, bro, pack it up. You're going behind the fence now, right? Like you're going to go do your time. Right. Yeah, so I was actually in county for um, a total of 30 days. And then what happens is you go through an intake, right? You go to an actual pod where they're the same people that are waiting to catch a chain, catch a bus to go to the penitentiary, right? right? So I was in county for about 30 days. I caught that chain. I caught that bus. Then I went to a diagnostics unit and I was supposed to only be there for two months, but I was there for six months because they had lost my paperwork. That is the Texas judicial system, by the way, they lose everything. Right. And you're just sitting there and, and part of actually probably like not a fun place to be. Not at all. Like that. You'd rather be behind the fence or wherever you're going to get going than you would in that holding period. Cause that's, yeah. And I used to watch people, you know, come in every so and so, pack it up, you're out, you know, and they're going behind the fence, right? So, yeah, there's three phases <laughs> of incarceration, right? There's the county jail, then you go to the diagnostics unit. If you're going to the penitentiary, you're going to the diagnostics unit, which is like a bus station. Mm. Um, that's where they take your blood, they do the psych test, you have to take an IQ test to see if you're a genius or not. If you're a genius, good luck, your time's going to be harder in prison yeah. because they're not going to let you in population. Right. If you've got an IQ above a 125, then that's going to take you onto a more maximum security type of prison. Right. So there's three phases, that county, that diagnostics unit, 
which is part of the, the prison system, and then your ID unit. That's where you're gonna go for the rest of your time. So each of those transitions were different because county jail was like, I'm still stuck in my sorrow. Yeah. I'm still stuck in my agony. I'm still, you know, trying to find hope, but I can't find it. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, talk to God. I'm angry at God. I'm yelling at God, right? But if I can just tell you a quick little story about the first glimmer of hope I ever had in my life is when I was sitting in a five by nine medical cell, they had me in suicide watch right after my conviction. They had sent him to 25 years day for day, right? I'm in this medical cell and it's so crazy because in, in, in jail, you probably went through this too, but they give you like your bare necessities. They give you a toothbrush, they give you a bar of soap, they give you, um, they give you a blanket, they give you a towel and they give you, um, a, and then all of, out of all things, they give you a Bible, right? They give you a Bible. And, uh, but like for me, I, I started laughing. I started laughing because I'm like, out of all things, you, I, I get it, all these necessities, but then you give me a Bible, right? right? I thought it was so interesting why the jailer, jailers would give me a Bible of all things. It's so crazy about seeds, right? And you talk about the, the whole metaphor of seeds being planted into your life. It's like, yeah, I went to like RC class and all that and I got to learn about Jesus. And, and uh, it's amazing about those seeds because now when my life is getting derailed, I'm literally going back onto the things that were instilled to me when I was a kid. Mm. And for the fact that I picked up that Bible and I knew like there could have been something in here that could help me and I picked it up, I read it cover to cover in a matter of two days because I had simply nothing else to do. Did I study it? Absolutely not. Yeah. Did I gain anything? Probably not. Um, but that happened later on, the next three and a half years. Yeah. But when you talk about hope, man, hope is seeing a light on, light on the other side. I didn't have it at first, but then um, when you talk about faith, it's about the, the product of, of experiences that you, that, you, um, that you feel, right? That you, that you experience. And so a lot of times people are like, how can you have faith when you can't see it, yeah. right? It's like, well, if you can feel God is working in your life, you've got faith. It's funny that you say that about, about the book because I was telling you about when I first went to jail and I was in an isolation jail cell. Yeah. I, legitimately, I'm coming in and out of seizures, right? And I'm, I'm begging them because I'm in, I'm in isolation, right? You know, if being in the hole, being in isolated, bro, it's, it's after so long, you're like, you're, you're losing your mind, right? So, and I wasn't even in there for like a week, right? And I'm begging them, give me a book, give me something. Well, let me go to general population, right? And before, couple hours go by there. Oh, when you don't go get books in here, you don't get any books in here. You know, you shut up. I get in here, you know, next thing, you know, bean flap comes down, this book comes flying in. Right. And this is like, dude, I mean, this is after I just seven days earlier, I'm like ready to off myself and end my life. Right. And I get this Bible that gets thrown through the bean flap and I open up the Bible, right? I, again, I was raised in church. My grandpa was a preacher. I grew up in a, in a Southern Baptist church. Like I, every Sunday you went to church, but I was like the prodigal son, bro. I was ran off in the world. I wanted to see everything it had to offer. And when I asked for a book, I didn't ask for the Bible, right? But like what I asked for in that moment, God heard me, right? Yeah. Bean flap comes down, book comes flying in. I open Holy Bible, right? I opened the Bible, just like you opened the Genesis. I opened to Ezekiel. Mm. I don't, you don't read the book of Ezekiel, right? It's just not a book that you go and read. Like when I open it, there's underline, it's Ezekiel 36 and it's, you know, Ezekiel 36 has become it's just something that I live by, but it's Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. And it talks about, I'm gonna take the stony stubborn heart out of your chest. I'm gonna give you a heart of, I'm gonna sprinkle clean water on you and I'm gonna give you a heart of flesh. And I, I just close it and I start crying, right? Because it was like in that moment, it was like, all right, God, like you got my attention. It wasn't coincidence that those cop, that, that cop pulled me over. Like, you're here. What do you want from me, right? I knew that when I went back in front of the judge and the judge is like, look, you're, we're not doing anything until you go complete two programs. You got two six months programs, you go and complete, complete them and we'll see you back for, you know, decide what your final sentence is, right? I dug into that Bible, bro. I didn't, like you said, it wasn't social media. There wasn't Facebook. There wasn't Instagram. It was the Bible. bro. Yeah. And that was it. Like, you know, and, and for me in that moment, when you talk about hope and faith, like I didn't want to be there. I, I, I couldn't, to be honest, I, I never in a million years could have ever seen myself. There's nobody in my family that that's their story. Like there is no 
jail in my family. There's no drugs in my family. There's no addiction in my family. Like, let me ask you this. So like, whenever it comes down to like your drug addiction and you abusing drugs, there's always got to be that point, that source, that time where you've, at, you've done it for the first time. At what point in your life, what age were you, what, where were you at? Because I know a lot of pe listeners right now, they might be going through drug addiction. Yeah. I mean, it, it, here's, the, here's what I'll say about, here's what I'll say about addiction because I understand it really at, at the core, right? And I have addictive personality and anything, anything that, that feels good or that, you know, I, I can eat too much damn food at times because I, it feels good, it tastes good, and I like it, right? When I was molested at 11 years old, I didn't realize at the time, but I took my first hit of weed at 13. I took my first drink of alcohol at 13. You know, I took my first pill at 15. Like, I started to find these types of toxic avenues that I thought was escaping what was at the core. The like, core was guilt and shame. The core was self-hate. At the core was, I, I can't, can't believe that this has happened to me. You're talking about like 11, almost 12 years old, right? My friends were 13, 14, yeah. hitting puberty. You start talking about gay this, gay that, like I'm not gay. Yeah, you're you fully know. comprehending what's happening to you. And so for me, I think I was always seeking to run from that. And then all of a sudden here I am like 15 years old, scholarship offers come rolling in. I don't want anybody to know that. You know what I mean? So like for me, it wasn't only an escape, but like I was constantly trying to fit in with everybody else. Cause I just wanted to feel normal. Like I wanted to feel a part of, I wanted to feel accepted. And a part of me was like, it wasn't that I wasn't accepted, but it was like this insecurity that I had inside because I felt dirty, bro. I felt dirty. I felt like, you know, I was stained. And when I, when I would, you know, use drugs and, and eventually it came to Xanax, right? When I discovered Xanax, bro, I discovered that I could take a Xanax pill and I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about anything. Not, not only would not think about anything, I wouldn't remember anything. For me, I was escaping what I needed to, to resolve all along, right? The reality is, is bro, we're human. Yeah. Like we go through things in our life that are, are going to affect you. They're going to break you. Unfortunately, sometimes we're dealt cars that we didn't deserve, bro. Yeah. And that's just, I didn't deserve that at 11 years old. Bro. I didn't deserve that, you know? And so for me, I, what's at the core of every drug addict is something just like I went through at 11 years old, bro. It's oh, I that, believe that's that. what's at the yeah. core. Yeah. And, 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 and they'll tell you, no, it, that's at the core. I'm not saying that's their story, but at the core, it's something that has happened to them in their past that they are not willing to get to the core and handle it, bro. It's the surface level shit. Everything, everybody wants to talk about surface level. We'll talk about the surface level. Nobody wants to talk about what's at the core. But you're exactly right. Is that behind every addict, there was a stone that got tossed into a, wa sure. to a lake, yeah. right? And then now it's like getting down to that source you found out what that source was, and now you're able to speak to people about it because you're actually tapping into your purpose. Sure. You're actually doing something that fulfills you. You've made a lot of money in your life, right? My business has become very super successful and money has th definitely came in my end. Right. But you were explaining one day that you made, you made all this money, but you still felt empty. Sure. Everybody goes through that. Yeah. I mean, truly, dude, there's a difference between happiness and joy. For, for instance, I really, uh, when, I, when, I, when I feel joy in my life, I truly, truly understand that God is moving. I really think that the confidence you have now to be able to go and publicly speak about your story, about what ha had happened to you and how you can glorify God in it, is understanding that true confidence is when God is winning. I love when Zanti says that in one of his songs called Wartime, is that he talks about true confidence is knowing that God is winning in your life, yeah, you know? And so uh, I'm gonna get that actually framed in my office, but I think that's super cool, man. And, and I think when you get to that point, it's, it's, it's really awesome, bro. To give you a little perspective about, about prison, the penitentiary, um, I, I went to an ID unit, I went to a supermax unit here in Texas. Texas and California are some of the toughest prisons, okay? Depending on what unit you actually go on, 
well, there's this, there's these two different type of units. And then there's like units in between. There's the Cadillac unit where everybody's just doing their time, getting through their time. Usually it's like 30 plus year sentences. Everybody's been there already 30 years. And then there's like the newer units, which are called gladiator units. Those are where the 18, 19 year olds that go with life sentences, 30, 40, 50. Those are the ones that people just don't have enough. They don't have anything to lose. Mm. Right. So thank God. I feel like I feel like when you when I look back on it now, I just feel God moving so much in my my case because there was a guy in the county. Um, I spent I spent that time in the county, and there was thank God I was on a in a pod where there was actually people that were coming from the prison on bench warrant to go to to another trial and pick up another life sentence, and they had already knew my case from the from the from the news and was watching the news and was like, hey, um, yeah, you're not gonna have a good time in prison, buddy. That's what one guy told me, but he's like, I mean, and, and just for people to understand, right? Like, yeah. If they don't understand this, what you're being accused of, like I learned really quick, like you, you life, either hit yeah. the fucking door yeah, or life expectancy is days, not years for, for child molesters. Um, and there is people in there, man, that specifically prison that you would not let your, within your family of, with a hundred foot stick. They're so sick. Yeah that and i look at them as sick you know i look at them as they need a healer Mm. legitimately and there's been times where i've prayed for people man one of my cellmates my third cellmate his name was crazy he had a he had a bald head he was hispanic he was part of the like mexican mafia or something he had eight portraits of kids on his his head i'm like oh that must be his family or maybe his kids he killed all those kids and that's what he was in there for. He killed his whole family and been burned his house down. This is all gonna be in my book too, where I'll go into deeper depth, where I actually get to get down to the nitty gritty and, and go down deep into things that I've suppressed and not talked about for a while. Um, and things that my wife knows and nobody else knows. And one of the things I'll talk about here was my first experience of having to fight in prison. Um, you have to, everybody does. A hard check means they wanna see how hard you are right? There's this old, um, they called it the red door, which is like a fire escape door. And of course, diagnostics has cameras, but that red door was the only blind spot in the whole 54 man pod in diagnostics. And so somebody like a, like a tank boss or something, um, specifically somebody representing like a white Hispanic gang. I look white. I look white, you know, I'm half Hispanic, but I look white. I take more of my dad's characteristics. Who's Irish. And, um, but a white person would come up to you. It doesn't matter what you're in there for. They're going to come up to you and say, Hey, let's go catch the red door. I have no idea what that means. Okay. And, but it's so wild, man, because it was like, it was like I was in a movie or something. It's like, I'm sitting there and he's like, Hey, let's go catch the red door. And then I was like, okay, what, what, okay. What, what's going on over there? You know? (laughs) And, and, but then the guy's like, Hey, you're about to go fight. I was like, fight. I don't want to fight. I want no trouble. I'm good. I just. I'm just, I didn't do anything. I, I don't deserve to be here. You know, I, it, he's like, right, yeah. you need to go fight, dude. And do not quit. Don't quit. Do not give up and do not lay down. Just if you're getting beat up, just keep getting beat up. And I was like, okay. Then uh, there was this old guy that was like, hey, you know, take your shirt off. You know, it's gonna, <laughs> gonna make you a little better, you know? And so, yeah. so I, and then I go over there to the red door and, and it was first, it was one-on-one. I ended up beating up the guy who one-on-one. And at this time, dude, I'm yoked. You know, I've been working out in the right. county jail. I've been working out before I went to prison too. I didn't stop working out. I love to work out. Um, I was like 235 pounds. I've never been 235. And I was like 8.5% body fat. So I was like, they knew, okay, we're gonna bring two guys on you. And then eventually four guys were jumping me. And that's all I remember. And then, you know, um, I was bruised up pretty bad. My ribs were bruised up. And then, you know, the guards came in because they figured out what was going on and, and they broke it all up. I ended up going to the infirmary. Everybody went to the infirmary. And then I ended up going into a seg cell because everybody who it doesn't matter if you start the fight or you're the victim in the fight, you're going to seg. <laughs> right. So just to, just to kind of give you insight of what I had to deal with initially going into prison, that's the world inside of a world I talk about. Not many people know that type of world. We have all our luxuries here, a roof over our head, a nice warm meal to get in a truck and go to the gym and, and just 
just do your routine. Well, in prison, there's a routine too, but you, you can only operate within the freedoms that are given to you in prison. Now, you were talking about county jail. County jail is hell compared to prison, actually, when it comes to your freedoms. In prison, you get to choose what type, really get to choose what type of time you have. Right. And so um, now I kind of just kind of like uh, de-escalated my whole um, exposure to violence because I signed up for college. And so I took college classes. So I got redirected after diagnostics to a more Cadillac, but still semi-dangerous unit because it was still an ex-gang affiliated unit. Everybody and so, in that unit was going to college? Not everybody. It was just had a college program, but it was also a unit called a grad unit where all these people, when you get gang affiliated in, in prison uh, and you get caught, you have to go through now a program, you get put in segregation and you have to go through a program where you defiliate from that gang. And it takes up to like five years of you spending 23 hours in, one hour out. So now you gotta think about this. That unit, a lot of ex-gang members that defiliated from the gang, but still has that, that heart of stone, you know what I mean? Yeah. And brainwash racism, all go to this unit that's supposed to be a cool unit, but in reality, it's like all these people that like wanna do better, but still stuck in their old ways. Yeah. And so that's where the violence still happens. And um, yeah, it's it's wild, man. Um, Before I got transferred to Marion County, let me tell you my story about my first fight in June. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't get heart checked, but I told you I was in the isolation jail cell and I'm like detoxing, right? Like yeah. my stomach is a mess, yo. Like I'm talking like I, I legit, I, I had shit all over myself, bro. Like I, my bowels were a mess, I'm detoxing, right? Yeah, you can't control nothing. And they finally, like after 15 days of being in this isolation jail cell, they let me go to general population. And I was so excited, bro, just to like get out of that little cell, right? I remember that, man. And like, we get, there's like one bunk left, right? Top bunk, I get on the top bunk and you know, child's at four o'clock in the morning, right? And so I couldn't wait to eat. I was finally hungry, right? Mm. And I fall asleep, and the next thing you know, you hear that beam flap chop, cha, right? Everybody's feet just kind of slowly hit the floor. Everybody's quiet in the morning, right? Nobody's talking during chow. And I sit down at this table, and you know, in the county jail, there's this, they got the stainless steel benches and then the table, right? And it's me, my bunkie sitting across from me, and this other dude is sitting right here, right? And my, I can feel my stomach, like, start bubbling. And I'm like, oh, God. Bro, I've never, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know jail etiquette. Like I'm not from jail. All I know is my stomach is bubbling, bro. And I'm got this plate of biscuits and gravy in front of me and I'm so hungry, but I got a fart, bro. And I'm like, I'm going to try to like, let it out silent. Right. And I'm on this stainless steel bench and it's just like, <laughs> I'm like, this dude knows he didn't fart, right? Like, he knows it wasn't him. And this dude across from me, my bunkie, he just, like, fork in his hands. Which one of you just shit on my breakfast? Mm. And I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like, bro, sh I'm sorry. I'm sick. Like, I'm sorry. He's like, nah. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Yeah, yeah. Get to the shower. I'm like, get to the shower. Like, what are you talking about? I'm not going to the shower. Like, I'm not gay. I'm not going to the shower. I don't know what, what, what goes on in here. Yeah. I'm not going to the shower, right? Yeah. And now he's like getting loud and it's like four in the morning, right? Like, I'm embarrassed. I'm like, the one thing in my mind, I'm thinking like, I know I'm gonna be, I'm not gonna be a bitch, bro. I'm gonna, gonna fight or whatever I gotta do, right? Yeah. And he's like standing next to me. And the only thing that I could think to do was I stood up really slow and I just grabbed this tray of biscuits and gravy and I just whoop, pop, and I just bum rushed him. And it was like five seconds later, guards came in, beat the shit out of me, threw me right back in yeah. that isolation jail cell that I just came from, bro. And I was like. You know, the funny thing about fights in prison and in jail is that they don't last long. No, right. And, and it, it was out of this, out of just shit. It was like they thing. were waiting, they were watching, waiting. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it's out of just. Really, there's multiple factors. One, like they're waiting for something to pop off, but then again, everybody's out of shape in there. Nobody can actually go through a fight. There was multiple times where like people have like just thrown a couple punches and then there was one guy that tried to go the distance, but they just ran out of wind within 20, 30 seconds. Yeah. Nobody's really in shape in prison. There's been times where um, you want to talk about the craziest thing. I just thought about it. I think I told you this before, but um, the craziest thing I, that happened to me in prison, I saw, and happened to me in prison was the first riot I was ever in. 
and it was over a freaking TV show. It was, we, I was on um, C2 block, which is a pretty tough block. A2, C2 were the toughest blocks I was on. Um, and Animal Kingdom, that show Animal Kingdom was super popular. And it was also like the NFL playoffs. You had to have been incarcerated at the same time. Were you watching that too? Yeah. That was a huge show. And there was two TVs in the cell block. One was over movies. The other one was NFL football. And one of the TVs went down. So now this is a cell block full of like 120 people, 125 people. And everybody at night comes out of their cells to go and use the phone, play dominoes, do a little gambling, watch football, watch movies. It's just, it's like a, like a market. Like if yeah. you think of like a market, like a, like a flea market, everybody's rocking and rolling, selling stuff. There's a little convenience store in the corner over here with people reselling stuff from commissary and, and everybody's doing their little hustle, you know? And, Here's me and my, my buddy Ray Ray, my buddy Thomas, and my buddy uh, Smiley. We're all just doing a Bible study, you know? We're, we're learning about the Lord. And we're just chilling, and we're just trying to do right, my God, and just learn about His Son. And I'm growing in my faith at the time, yeah. and this is like my first four or five months in prison. And yeah, welcome to the penitentiary, buddy. I was just sitting there, and um, I just hear this thing going on where it's like, you know, TV's broken down, blah, blah, blah. Like, everybody's like, hey, let's, let's watch Animal Kingdom. He's like, no, this is the sports TV, right? He's like, no, no, this is the season finale of Animal Kingdom. He's like, no, this is the NFL playoffs. We're going to watch this. So one of the TVs goes down, and they, they actually have to get to a vote whenever there's no, like, actual, you know, justice on, like, what's going to happen. There was, like, 40-something people that did NFL playoffs. There was, like, 50-something people that did Animal Kingdom. And then the, the NFL players was like... <laughs> No, maybe that was the other way around. It was like more so NFL, less so Animal, Animal Kingdom, Kingdom, right? And so um, the the guy was like, "No, no, no, this is some BS. This is some BS. We're gonna uh, we're gonna watch Animal Kingdom." He's like, "You know what, man? Like, we did a great, we did a vote, this and that." I'm like, I look back down at my Bible. I'm like, well, I'm not trying to pay attention to what's going on there. There's some drama. I'm looking down, man. And next thing you know, I just hear, hoo, hoo, and I look up, I look up. And all I see is a dude's, like the TV cord of one of the TVs wrapped around this guy's neck and he's holding him up against the wall. And then next thing you know, I mean, they're gang affiliated. Everybody hops up from the benches. They start going at each other. Um, and it just pops off, man, within a split second. And I remember the next thing that had happened while everybody was pulling out their shanks and going at each other, it was so fast, Ray Ray grabbed my collar and started pulling me. I thought I was about to get attacked. I thought somebody was attacking me. He says, Greg, come here. And he grabs me and we go against all the way to the back corner of the cell block and our backs are against the wall. He said, put your back against the wall, mm. right? And he, I remember Ray Ray just grabbing me like this and just making sure nothing happens to me. Yeah. Right? This is like my spiritual father, right. you know what I mean? He's the one who, he's actually he's from Austin. For you. He's looking out for me, man. You know, there's guys in there that do yeah, that. For sure. He had already been in there 32 years. He's on oh, a life geez. sentence, something he did when he was 16 years old. They, went, yeah. they were trying 16 year olds. And he, he, he was in a gang affiliated um, uh, gun, gun fight in South Austin. He had killed somebody and he was just one bullet away from him getting killed, but he ended up being a knucklehead and sure. talked off to the judge during sentencing and he's like you know what i'm gonna teach you a lesson young man you're going to prison for the rest of your life and that's and he's in there for the rest of his life huge man of the lord right love that guy to death still in my life to this day but he was looking out for me he had he, had, he was like this and then i'm right in front of my eyes i'm seeing people get stabbed i'm seeing people die i'm seeing all this stuff happen and the next thing you know, I just see within a split second, guards coming in with turtle suits, shields, bazookas. And next thing I hear is do, do. And Ray Ray said, take off your shirt, put it around your face mm -hmm. and breathe slow. Yeah. Breathe slow. Squint your eyes, breathe slow. Mm. And so I do. And from there, everything just goes in. All those people that were fighting, just fog happens. Yeah. And I don't know what's in front of me. And he's just saying, man, just keep breathing slow, keep breathing slow. This is like probably, Ray Ray's been in dozens of these things. Yeah. So he knows. And then as the fog subsides and people start getting taken out of the cell block, I'm walking past puddle one of blood, puddle two of blood, 
puddle three of blood. This guy over here slowly squirming and moving, is yelling in pure agony, right? And I, I start closing my eyes, I can't see this anymore. And I, I walk out and then immediately they start s s filing us. I mean, dude, it felt like the Holocaust, dude. Like it felt like I was in a gas chamber and I, we were, there's like, take off all your clothes and we're getting butt ass naked. And we're standing like literally nut to butt, mm. ready to get marched out to the showers and think we're gonna catch a break because in prison is so hot. In Texas, there's no AC system. Your, your, your pores are open, sweat's coming out of your skin. Everything's open. So tear gas, man, burns everything oh. that's open inside of your body, your eyes, your nose, you can't stop snot, can't stop coming down your face, you can't stop crying. And then that tear gas gets into your pores, you're in living hell now, physical hell, mm -hmm. you're burning. And then you think you're gonna catch a break and go to the showers where there's some cold water? Heck no, they have it steaming hot in the middle of summer, 104 degrees inside yeah. this thing. And now you just, I mean, you just think about just the physical and the mental just agony you're going through. That's the craziest thing that ever happened to me in prison amongst a lot of things. So. I feel like you know we've we like we've talked a little bit about the like the the war stories of of being incarcerated. When you got to the end of that appeal process, and what was that? What was that like? Because again, I'm I'm trying to understand how how you how the appeal process went down from your team on the outside working on your case. Three and a half years go by right? A s extremely long process. At what point were you like hearing from your attorneys or your team that like, hey, you might have a chance to get out? The whole dynamics of my case was that I, I, I was forced to waive my right to appeal my trial to get the less sentence of 25 years. I was forced, what I mean by forced. What were, what were you facing if 25 years was 25 what? to 99. And then what had happened was now that this jury who had just wrongfully convicted me, right? So you waived your right to appeal. I had to waive my right to appeal. I didn't have to. My, what happened was is that the same jury that just convicted me, right? I'll just rewind. I was offered five years probation to not go to trial. Me being a person that stands up for the truth at that time, and, and it wasn't a, a cakewalk. It wasn't right. a, a walk in the park to make this decision. I had to weigh a lot of things. But when it came down to it, I remember telling you this. I, I, had, I walked in the bathroom after that last probation offer was given to me right before trial, and I looked at myself in the mirror. And I remember one thing my dad had told me um, when I got caught stealing when I was a freshman in high school and I almost went to jail, I had stolen something from um, a Kohl's department store, some shoes, and I was caught red-headed. I was on the surveillance camera and everything. And, and at that time, I figured I was really good at football. And my dad, I remember, had picked me up and he was driving me home and, and he didn't decide to like yell at me or anything. He just like looked at me and he's like, you know how much you have going for you, Greg? You know, you know you're a phenomenal athlete. You're, this is not who you are. You're very blessed to not be able to go to jail right now that I could pick you up and the cops would let you go with me because you right. did steal over like $50 or something worth of shoes. And he says, you got to figure out real quick, son, what type of man you're going to be in this world. Mm. And I get emotional about that because my dad's no longer here. And I, I thank him for telling me that because sure. whenever I had to figure out a man moment in my life, the biggest man moment of my life is when I had to either decide to stand in front of everyone I know, who I love, the judge, my mom, my friends, my girlfriend, and, and just say that I did something I didn't do, mm. or go fight for the truth. And I remember going to the bathroom, I asked my attorney, can I please just go in the bathroom really quick? And, and I remember looking at myself in the mirror, I, and I said, Greg, what type of man are you gonna be? It's like my dad was telling me that. And amongst all things, even though I wanted to take the plea because I knew that it wasn't going to be a chance of me stepping in prison and that potentially this could just be all over and I can just move on. Maybe football is not going to be there anymore, but I, at least I won't go to prison. Sure. It's so crazy when you're backed in a corner and, and you're so hopeless and nothing, you know, you're not supposed to be in this position. And that's, 
you're in a county with a 98% conviction rate and you're wondering why 98% of convictions or 98% of convictions. And, and I sit there and I, I don't know what got a hold of me, man. I think it was God. Um, just say, man, just fight for the truth. And no matter what, even if you fall, I felt like he was going to be there in either way. Yeah. And then I said, you know what, I'm going to fight for my life. And I, I, I literally told Patricia, you can tell the DAs to shove it up their ass. I literally told them that. And, and um, I went to go fight and I lost. But imagine if I didn't fight. Right. Let's just think about that dynamic. Imagine if I didn't fight. You and I would have never met. Right. We've never been right here shooting a, pod, uh, shooting a pilot for the get back. It's amazing that whole, you just backtrack it like that, man. Like, it's like truly, man, like you can just really harvest the purpose out of pain. This is the was purpose your, part. Was your dad, what, was your dad, when did your dad pass away? My dad passed away um, four months before I got exonerated. So I had to bond, I got bonded out. You know, we talk about three and a half years of going through the desert, right? And before I get to that part where my dad passed away, I want to explain to you about simply what it means just to consider it all joy, even when you're going through your pain. The Bible says to consider all joy, right? No matter what you're going through, that trouble comes in the night, it will joy will come into the morning. So it doesn't matter in, in, in your darkness, you can still be joyful. Right. And it talks about that whenever the Bible talks about when Moses was taking the Israelites out of Egypt and they were stuck in the desert. They were wondering why they were stuck for so long, but man, those Israelites, they were kind of complaining all the time. And sometimes people don't realize that just simply you complaining while you're in the middle of your pain can prolong that pain to be longer. Yeah. And then now you get to a point where if you just rejoice in the middle of your pain, it even, it, it, Paul even talks about it in, in his, uh, his epistles where he's like, man, you know what, man, we just rejoiced and sang and the prison doors were flinging open. The chains were coming off. Breaking. They were breaking. That's right. That can literally mean in your life where you're in the middle of pain and you can just praise and thank God that, that you're still in the middle of your pain. And next thing you know, it's, it's over. It's over. You know? And I chose to rejoice and figure out who Jesus is to me in my life and fill myself up with that. And then next thing you know, the day came in August 2nd, 2nd, 2017, when I had an innocence hearing, I got bench warranted back out of nowhere, dude, it happened so quick. I was literally just coming back from work and my, my buddy was like, Hey man, like the, the guards are looking for you. You got an attorney visit. And Keith was saying like, Hey, you're about to get bench warranted. We got an innocence hearing for you, Greg. I said, what really? And it's like, and at the time I knew my, my case got reopened and there was work going on with the reinvestigation with the Texas Rangers and like hope was just, you know, flame was just yeah. becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, man, it happened so quick. Uh, August 2nd, 2017, I had that innocence hearing. It was three days and those three days, it was just pure vindication. The light was being casted upon all the darkness that was happening to me. Jesus was showing up, man. I felt like the Holy Spirit was in that courtroom that day. Mm. I felt like there was evil. And then, well, here's the crazy part, Zeke. The same courtroom that I was convicted in, I was exonerated, exonerated. in. Talk about vindication. Yeah. Just different judge, right? And what's so crazy is that it was a prophecy. There was somebody prophesied something over me when I was in prison and they spoke over that the king will set you free to me. And that just really perked up my ears because I'm like, I really need to be set free here. Yeah. And my judge is Judge Donna King. And that can mean like Jesus and her. I just amazing how that works out. Right. And so she's the one who exonerated me. Um, but you know, that day where I got released on bond, I, I spent two years now waiting for the CCA to exonerate me. And the day came after just pure agony of waiting again, you know, it's that desert, you know, just, it's like a hurry up and wait process. Um, I just waited every, for two years, just checking a list to see if the CCA was going to uh, exonerate me and they could either send me back, retry me or exonerate me. And the day came, you know, where I got exonerated in, two, in 2019. And my dad had passed in May, a couple of days after my birthday in 2019. He never really physically got to see me exonerated, but I know he did see me. Yeah. This is, you know, I want I want to touch on like the, the football side of things just because I feel like we can relate a lot in the sense of, bro, I sat in the jail cell 
and watched Jameis Winston get drafted. Mm. When I came out of high school, it was Jameis number one, me number two. He, you know, he wanted to go to Auburn, you know, and ended up going to Florida State. Great thing for Jameis. He wins the Heisman. He's the first pick in the draft. I go to Auburn. My story is a little bit different than his, but I sat in a jail cell, bro, and watched him walk across the stage thinking to myself, had I not just been an idiot, had I not just self-sabotaged my career, I didn't tear an ACL, bro. I didn't blow a back out. I didn't get hurt. I didn't get too many concussions. I sabotaged my career. And I had to sit there and watch it. Like, what was that like for you? Because again, at your time, at this time in your life, I, I already know your identity was football. Like that was my identity as well. I started to lose it at this point in time, but that's what I, that's who I was, right? You gotta be sitting there in your head and thinking like, I was just supposed to go to college. I was just to go, supposed to go play college football. These are the dreams that you have. Had you just like given up on them? Are you like, cause again, you're talking about three years, right? Like that's a lot of time that goes by where like in the back of your, your mind, again, you're not in prison talking to these coaches. Like you have no idea if they're even even thinking about you still, right? Yeah. And so like, I'm genuinely curious how you handled that process because our stories are very similar in the sense that when I got out and you got out, we both still had this itch to play ball again, right? Like yeah. for me, when I got out, it was like, you know, I started speaking. I went back in front of the judge. The judge looked at me and said, you have two options. You can either go to treatment or you can go serve the, the rest of your three and a half years that are on the shelf. I was going to go to treatment, bro. I wasn't going back to jail. That wasn't an option for me, right? Good call. And when I finally got healthy, I started chasing that dream again. But there was a point where I was sitting in that jail cell, bro. And I legitimately thought, I'll never play ball again, bro. It's done. It's done. And it's like one of the only things in life, like, bro, you don't get to redo those four years of college. Like that time is ticking and when it's done, it's done. High school is done, it's done, bro. Like, what, 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 what was your thought process? Was it even a thought? Were you even like thinking about football or at this point are you just like, I just want to get out? Like, no, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a, man, identity is a weird thing. Identity is such a weird thing. You know, ultimately, I figured out that my identity is in Christ I, now. But when I was a football player, my identity was in football. football yeah. That's what I idolized in my life was football. That's great. You know, go play, go play football. It's great. It could be a phenomenal thing, a joy that you love to do. But at the end of the day, I figured out now that I've, when I've matured in my faith is before all of these things, my identity needs to be rooted in Christ and how I see him, how he sees me, my best reflection every day of who he is, how I, you know, how I conduct myself is my ministry. And it's it's wild, man, because when you think about identity, it's like your identity differs, your surface level identity, right? It differs on which room you're in. What I mean by that is like my identity with my boys or my identity with my boys. Like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a brother, I'm a friend, but then I got a little girl coming along the way, you know, Gabriel's pregnant, my wife's Congratulations, pregnant. Thank you, yeah, thank you. You know, girl, dad, girl, dad, girl, maybe, dad. Yeah, yeah, Team girl, dad. Yeah, I gotta get some get some pointers from you. Um, but you know, that's it's 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 wild because I know my identity in my in my with my little girl is gonna be different. Sure, you know, she's gonna steal my heart. It's you know, I'm gonna be melted in her hands. You know, yeah. um, and my identity to my wife's different. So, when well, I, while you're talking about that, yeah. you said something to me the other day, and it it really hit me, bro. It it makes me emotional, legitimately, because. You, you and Gabriel had conversations about, first of all, being a father is like the greatest thing ever, bro. Like you're gonna love being a dad. I love my daughter to death, bro. Uh, she's a, but you said something, bro, that was just like, gosh, it just, you were like, we didn't think we would ever be able to have a family. That was not a possibility like, when I was going When you're facing that. 25 years, bro, you're talking, she's 45, you're 45. If I had done all 25. Yeah, years. like, yeah. well, you know, if, you, like, what is that like now knowing like you get that opportunity and there was a point in time, I mean, bro, like that hits me at the core because there's people that they're in the same situation as you right now and they, they didn't get exonerated, bro. 
Yeah, you know, my exoneration is something really special. It's it's a miracle in itself because most people that we got to understand, most people that get exonerated, they don't get exonerated after three and a half years, four years of injustice. For me, since the accusation was six years, all in all, my whole case. Yeah. Right. But a lot of people, they get out after being exonerated 20, 30 years of fighting for their innocence. And they're old men when yeah. they get out. And it's something where they got wrongfully convicted in their 18, 19, 20, 21, whatever, in their 20s. A lot of times exonerations happen due to the, due to the advancement of DNA technology. Sure. So in my case, there was no DNA. In my case, I, will, I got deemed actually innocent because simply they got the wrong guy. You know what I mean? Like it, it, was, my, it was my once best friend who actually, we believe, did the crime. It's so sad because he actually never got to be tried and prove that he actually did it but all the evidence pointed to him that if he actually went to trial he would be found guilty and this is the whole thing when you talk about not doing the right investigation and finding the real perpetrator the real one the one who actually did the assault goes out and victimizes more victims mm -hmm. and that's what happened in my case jonathan went to go and drug and rape four girls while i'm sitting in jail as an innocent person you talked about sitting there as an ex-football player my identity completely stripped from me. Samaji Piran, he was a running back for the Redskins, now the Commanders, but he was a run, running back. <laughs> he went to OU. Yeah. He played at Hendrickson High School. Phenomenal running back. Went to go play in the league. Maybe still in the league. I haven't followed yeah, since then. Uh, he might. I think he still yeah. is. But he, you know, he was the dog in this area. Like, he was all over the news, all state and all that. Well, I played against them, and I remember to this day, man, and I'll always brag about this because I earned it. I flat-backed that dude in the hole on a safety <laughs> zero blitz my junior year in football in, at, at varsity. I will always remember that, and he does too. I promise. He said he does too. And so um, it, that's an accomplishment for yeah. me because I'm like – but then again, it's heartbreaking because I sat there on a and in a prison bench watching him play ball at OU, and yeah. it, it hurt me so bad that I had to get up and leave and go back to my cell because I just couldn't watch football. Sure, I I, I completely understand that. I felt the same way, and, and it and it hurt mm -hmm. me for a lot of years, up until the point that I decided to train again to play ball, and had the opportunity to make it back and get a chance to play in the NFL. I couldn't watch football, bro. Like, that's the honest to God's truth. I couldn't watch it without being full of just shame, bro. You're watching it thinking, I got effed, bro. I got screwed, right? Fast forward to you getting out, right? And and I don't want to get too far ahead, but fast forward to you getting out. What switch flipped in your head? Because for me, I was like, if I don't ever give this a shot again, I'm going to live the rest of my life with doubt or question or regret. There's a mixture of things, Zeke. You know, when I was when I got put away in, in prison, football was all I knew. That was my identity. If you ask me now, after the fact, and me going, you know, getting out of prison, I, I've developed all these other skills. So when you talk about, like, me getting out and getting football back, it was more so that I was a superhero of my own story. Mm. I was looking at myself like, Greg, be proud of yourself. Like I was yeah. like, I was looking at myself in the mirror. I'm like, I can't believe I went through all that. I just got exonerated. Even when I wasn't exonerated, I chose to solely focus and put all my time and attention of just getting football back. So I had the opportunity to train with Jeremy Hills. Um, he was a sports, he's a sports performance coach in the area who yeah. trains all the NFL guys. And you see it in the documentary of me just training with these guys, trying to get football back, them being fully accepted towards me, knowing what I'm going through, saying, hey man, let's get it, Greg. Like, and what's so crazy, I was keeping up with these dogs. Like I was keeping up with these guys. And I was just like, wow, I could really do this. Yeah all these gifts that God gave me from birth that I didn't know I had. Yeah. Like to be able to, to be, the ability to work with my hands. I got into the craft shop. I, I, I learned how to do all these skills. I learned how to use power tools. Sure. And it serves me now as an entrepreneur who owns a business that has to do with woodworking and, yeah. and crafting and manufacturing an item that I sell, right? But I didn't know like, I didn't know any of that stuff. And so when I got out and I'm trying to pick football back up. The athleticism is there, but the desire and the passion yeah. has been substituted for something else. And 
it's so wild, man, because it's weird trying to get football back when you figure out really quick how important the 20, 21, 22, 24, yeah. 23, 24 year old lives, like the, those years of your prime are so important, yeah. right? Of the development of the game, mm -hmm. not the physical. Like right. I still got a, you know, 30 rep, 225 bench, yeah. right? I still can probably run a four, five, four, six if I really sprinted. Yeah. I mean, I'm fast still, but I just, the desire, I just matured. It's right. weird. And if you ask a lot of people, man, that have retired from the league, and they go and figure out how to sell homes or sell cars or get into business, they stop thinking about football. Yeah. Because now they're like, man, I'm good at this now. Yeah. Like I'm really good at this. Right. And it just takes their passion. And so I get that hundred percent. I wanna I wanna go I wanna I wanna go into something that I think is has been something in my life that has been a real difficulty in trusting other people that's affected me in my relationships, it's affected me in my businesses, it's affected me in many areas of my life, having a tough time trusting people because I have been betrayed. I have had people stab me in the back. I have had friends who I thought were best friends completely turn a 180. Dudes I thought were gonna be in my wedding one day were gonna be there for me for the rest of my life. I don't even speak to them, right? What was that, like, what, 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 ha, what has that experience been for you in dealing with the ultimate betrayal of having your best friend who you know knew he was guilty and you were paying for it? Like, what, what have you had to do? Because I'm genuinely asking for my own, because it's something I still struggle with, bro. I still struggle trusting people. I still struggle trusting men. Yeah. You know, I have an easier time trusting women than I do men, surprisingly. But I do have a tough time trusting men. I have a tough time getting close to people because I've been stabbed in the back, bro. I've been betrayed. I've been, you know, persecuted. I've been blasphemized, all that by people I loved and cared about. Yeah, no, I, I've dealt. I think the biggest thing that I've dealt with and I'm delivered from is unforgiveness. Mm -hmm. Like I don't have a, I don't have a lot of these issues that a lot of people have. Like I love um, uh, a whiskey every once in a while, but do I drink it every day? No. Does it have me, you know, in a vice? No. Right. Do I do I take drugs for pain? Yes. Do I use it to numb? Right. No. So it's just like all of these things that like people deal with and a lot of people don't understand that forgiveness is just as bad unforgiveness is just as bad okay. as all those things and so the biggest thing i was delivered from if you ask me that jesus has delivered me from was unforgiveness and it wasn't just for for like the da's office who wrong led the charge and wrongfully sure. convicting me it wasn't the detective chris daly for the, the cedar park police department who led the charge in the investigation or lack of investigation um, it wasn't, you know, Sean McCarty, uh, Jonathan's mother, who, who, who recommended me to an ineffective defense attorney who is conflicted because she previously represented Jonathan's brothers in sex crimes. Jonathan, in general, your best friend, a guy who you considered your little brother, backstabbing you. At one point when, when, when the case was getting reopened and the investigation that should have happened is now happening with the Texas Rangers years after it should have happened and me sitting in jail going through all I'm going through, when Jonathan's name gets popped up in this and this child pornography on his phone of, of his own nephew, like of, of all these, like just crazy. Yeah. And then the biggest thing for me what really, really sunk in was when Jonathan denied owning things that he did, that that he owned, yeah. that were part of the case. That was actually a significant part. That there's all this evidence of people witnessing, hanging out with him. He was wearing, and it was the clothes that that the assailant, the the victim said that the assailant wore when he got sexually assaulted. Right. And Jonathan denied every bit of it. Yeah. And now at that point, I'm like. And my best friend just just stabbed me in the back. Yeah. And, and I think I think the reality is as you talk about forgiveness is like, man, I lived in a world where <clears throat> unforgiveness really messed me up for a while, bro. You know, you talk about like the need to forgive, like bro, I had to find it in my heart 
to forgive the man that stole my soul at 11 years old. Yeah, I never told him, bro. I never went to his face and was like, oh, will you for, you know, I, I forgive you. Yeah. But when you're, when you're living a life stuck in unforgiveness, like, it's a virus. It's a, it's a cancer. It's hard for somebody who doesn't understand forgiveness or has never chosen to accept Jesus in their life to be forgiven of their own sins. It's hard to forgive somebody else, right? But when I was washed and I realized, you know what, like maybe I was a little dirty or I felt a little dirty, felt a little stained. Like when I gave my life to Jesus, like I realized like I've been washed clean, but I have to do some hard things that the Bible tells me I got to do. And I don't really want to do them. Like I didn't want to find the peace in my heart to forgive this guy who I felt like really stripped me of everything because again, I blamed him for my addiction for a long time. You know, I blamed him for why I made the decisions that I made, which caused me to, you know, sabotage my career, which cost me millions of dollars, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But it wasn't until I was sitting on my jail cell rack and the old head above me said, son, if you never learn to forgive, you'll be stuck in here forever. Yeah. And you're like, I don't mean this prison. I mean the one in your mind. Yeah. And so that's something that I've had to in my life. And for the people that are watching this, if you're struggling with this like feeling of hatred or unhappiness or anger that's inside of you and you're, it's coming out in ways of rage or, you know, impulsive behavior. There's something inside of you, bro, that you have to find some peace with. And for me, that was freeing myself of the bondage that I had allowed other people to have over my life, right? Freeing the control that I allowed them to have over myself and saying, you know what? I don't ever have to stand in front of this man who molested me at 11 years old and tell him to his face, hey, I forgive you. But in my heart, I made the decision yeah. That I was going to forgive him so I could forgive myself yeah. and move on. That's key. That's key, Zeke. You know, that's old, late, and great Kobe Bryant once said, you know, yeah, you can say God is good and you might know it, but until you try to carry that cross you can't carry, Jesus mm. tells us to pick up our cross daily, daily, right? Carry the cross. Carry your cross. See, unforgiveness was my cross I couldn't pick up. But Kobe Bryant once said in an interview, he said, man, you might say God is good, but until you, you can't pick up a cross you can't carry, and then Jesus picks up the cross and picks you up with it, mm. then you know. Yeah. Then you know. It's that point where you just crucify your flesh, that every like, desire not to forgive to the cross, yeah. and then pick it up and carry it, and that's something you're going to have to do daily, every single day. Make a decision to pick up your cross. That is literally commissioned to us. And being Christians, we know that Jesus can carry it for us when we can't. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it, man. It's like he, he's walking with us every single way. And that's, that's the internal relationship that you must have in your faith with Christ. And it's so sad nowadays that people have commercialized it to uh, get public or, or whatever, right? Name gain or whatever, right? You see there each and every day. But I think... You know, you were talking about forgiving so you could be forgiven. It's so beautiful, man, when you understand that formula of like forgiveness equals freedom. Yeah. And so with all those people that have wronged me, all the people that, that you've had to forgiven, it's never for them. It's for you. Right. It's for you. It's for you to be able to move forward. And that's, that's a very beautiful thing. It's everybody deals with it. I really think people that go through the toughest shit can really come out on top in a way that a lot of other people that don't deal with difficult things in their life aren't able to do right sure, the people sure. who really go through the storms and they weather them and they walk through them are the ones that always make it to the top right sure. and and people that can scave by life and there's not any real major issue like you know whatever you're eating for breakfast i want some of it but the reality is is like that's not life bro we're all going to go through it and it's how you choose to walk through it you went to you went to prison and we were talking about it it's funny 
you go in there, a, a, a star recruit, right? And you come out a woodmaker, a woodworker, and you've turned it into a successful multi seven figure business. That was never possible, bro. Call it what it is. Like you would have been a, probably a dumb athlete that draft that got you know got yeah. uh, finished school and you know maybe got a chance to league and then you know you're you're work, you're selling cars, bro. You know or something of the sort, right? Like yeah. that's the reality. So what for the for those people that don't know Greg, like what are you doing now? Because I think that's what the get back is all about. The get back is about going through the storm, weathering the storm and getting back everything in your life that you truly deserve, right? And so where are you at for the people that don't know and how has what you've gone through in your life, and I'll answer the same question, how, what you, how has what you've gone through in your life allowed you to kind of weather that storm to get back up and use those lessons, use that pain, use those dark moments to get back up in your life. I think it's like, it's it's the four Ps in my life. It's pain, purpose, passion. It's like, in order, if you can truly say that you're passionate about what you do in your career, you're never gonna work another day in your life. And that's kind of, I, I'm truly passionate about something that really helped me get through a really dark place, going through all of that. And, I, and it's, it's about that finding that purpose from that pain. And in order for that to happen, a lot of people, they don't want to go through the uncomfortable stuff. I mean, some people, if you can voluntarily make yourself uncomfortable, you'll build so much character during that process. And that character will then allow you to appreciate your achievements. I love to see a lot of people, it's like Pitbull once said this, he says, what comes in quick leaves quicker. Yeah. What comes in quick leaves quicker. If you win the lottery, good luck. You're probably not going to be rich in a month. You're going to blow all that stuff up. Right. It's the same. It's, it's, it's like you build the character along the way. Right. God works in your life. If you choose to follow him and you choose to have faith in him, you choose to allow him to fill that dark void inside of you. Right. You were talking about making the money and you're still empty. And for me, it's like, I, nothing's really about money for me. Yeah. It's great to have, be financially stable and be financially free and not worry about money. It's great to be in that position, but it's like now at what point do I start operating in something that has purpose? And now that I can find peace within myself, when, when I got out, dude, it was so hard for me to just ex like come to the reality that I'm comfortable now. Mm. Like when I got out, people don't realize, you think that when I got out, it's like, dude, you must be on top of the world, man. Like, right. like you, you must be loving life. Like, I'm like, no, man, like I got trauma. You know, I got pain I still deal with, you know? You might, you'll never see it. Yeah. I promise you, you'll never see it. I'll never wear it on my, on my sleeve. Yeah. You'll never see the stuff I still have to deal with. Yeah. The, the PTSD I have, man. Just to kind of give you a little insight, I'd worked at Costco the first month of the pandemic right? I had lost my, my, my gym job. And there was one time in Costco when I was, when I was stocking up shelves and all the lights went out and everybody started hooping and hollering, making funny noises and yelling all the employees out. and all of them were yelling. And immediately I put my back against the wall yeah. and I started breathing very heavily and everybody's going woo, 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 and all that. I'm like, well, last time that happened, people were dying. Right. So I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. like, I'm just real. And then, I, and then I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not there. I'm not there anymore, mm. you know? And then I just went on with my, I was like, that's some stuff I never really got to deal with, you know? Yeah. And um, still to this day, I'm claustrophobic. I can't, I can't get into close uh, tight spaces because I spent five months in a five by nine cell, 23 hours in, one hour out. Sometimes not given food because they, people knew who I was in there for. And there was a one time where there was a big heaping turd piece of crap on my tray because that's what they do in there when yeah. somebody doesn't like you, you know, they'll take your food and crap on your tray and dealing with all that, man, and getting out, I couldn't just accept that I was lit laying my first night in a very comfortable bed. It's oh so wild. Gosh, I, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep at all. I, being so long, just, we didn't it, even have pillows. I don't know if you can order. We didn't have pillows. We no didn't have pillows, pillows, bro. We had a rock hard, like it was like a synthetic, nasty, cotton, lumpy. Like it wasn't even a mattress. It I was, was a box. I pad. would take all my sweatshirts and my sweatpants and I put them and I put them in a pillowcase. And that was like my. Uh... So we didn't even have that. So like we just 
we just folded up a blanket and um i see i don't even think i had i don't even think they gave me some pillowcase i think i was just sleeping on my sweatshirt you probably what you did was you probably they definitely stuffed, didn't give you probably me stuff a... stuff in a boxer and then use it as a pillow that's that's what i did i sleep with socks around my eyes yeah or just both towels you know it's just it's just it's crazy man it's just the things you have to adjust from and not knowing that i was slowly getting institutionalized and it's just but then what really um and then biggest thing i struggled with too was being able to communicate yeah i i became super introverted and you'd be surprised man like when you don't talk to people it's so important to to socialize and talk to people yeah. and to have conversations and when I got out and I tried to like express what I'm going through, there was a time you watched the documentary that these reporters were asking me like, Greg, how do you feel? Greg, how do you feel? I'm like, well, um, good, happy. Yeah. I'm relieved a little bit. Um, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's literally what I said. And, um, and I'm just like, man, I wish I could say that better, you know? And I was beating myself over the head about that. But now, um, I've, I've challenged myself to really start talking and like even this podcast man like I'm challenging myself every day to have dialogue about this stuff and to to ask more questions and so and I think that's the point of this yeah. podcast and it's funny that I reached out now three years ago and I said Greg I think we're meant to do something great together bro I think what we've gone through the experiences the pain the stories that we have in our life they're meant to be shared. And again, we can sit in this episode and dive into details on the, the specifics and probably have a, a, an episode on each of the own because there's so much pain and, and just struggle in our stories. But the reality is, bro, is like you and I are just like everybody else out there that's watching this right now is like they're all going through something. Yeah. We're all going through something. The people you see on TV, the people you see on social media, the athletes, the, 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 the biggest of people that you look at and think, damn, their life is all together. They got to figure it out. That's not true. No. It's not true, right? And so, you know, part of, part of the, the mission of this, this show is to bring the authenticity and the realness and the vulnerability of people who need just a safe space and a safe audience who they can share that with, right? Like the reality is, is I reached out to you because bro, your story moved me. Yeah. Like your story, you know, June, 2021, when I reached out to you, bro, your story moved me. I didn't know I was gonna lose my dad in December of 2021. I didn't know that you had already lost your dad, bro. I, the, the experiences that you reach, hey, but praying for you, right? There's people out there that need other people who have been through tough shit to help them get through the tough shit that they're going through right now. Yeah. And sometimes it's just a story, a life story, a real story that somebody lived. You lived hell, bro. I've lived in hell. Yeah. I've lived in prisons in my own mind and, and actually in there. I've, I've been there. Yeah. The purpose of, of, of bringing messages and stories of high level individuals is to let the people out there understand that the shit you're going through right now, it will pass. Yeah. It will pass. And if you make the decision to stop having a pity party, stop making excuses, stop feeling sorry for yourself and just get back up. The get that's back. It. It's the get back. Just get back up. It's the get back, baby. It's that's, that's what's beautiful about it is, um, Man, I love running, and I know you love running now. I wouldn't say love it. No. But what do you say? You got to do shit that makes you uncomfortable. You got to do stuff that you you got to voluntarily suffer, you know. And you have to voluntarily put yourself in uncomfortable situations to ultimately fortify your mind, to grow, and to um, really callous things that you know are weak in your life. Mm. I love David Goggins. He says to callous your mind. You know, callous your mind. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm training right now to go run 100 miles in December to do a 100 mile ultra marathon. Only a couple of thousand people have done it. Um, and about 100 people every race are crazy enough to do it. Um, and this, see, that's something I just don't see myself doing. I, right now, I can't yeah. see myself running 100 miles. But I've decided to, I know all things are possible with Christ. 
So like, if I believe that, I'm like, I'm good. Like I, I, I just need to prepare myself to get to that point where I'm confident enough to be able to do that. And I think setting a date in December will be able to do that. I just, I, I right now I'm in a 10K training block where I, I run 6.2 miles every day for the next eight days. Yeah. And then I increase it up to eight miles, but it's that progression. And eventually I'll be running 40 miles a day, right? And I'm like, okay, I can do this in 24 hours. So it's like, I'm building character. I'm building confidence by voluntarily getting uncomfortable. And now I can start seeing me actually do it. Yeah. And so that pain that you're going through, what you're talking about, everybody's going through it. It's like, there's a get back in that pain. That's right. That's right. So it's a beautiful thing, man. It's very cool to be able to p provide a space where people can become vulnerable and talk about it. Uh, because the last thing you, that's, that's, I mean, the last thing you could ever do is not talk about it. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm really excited for the guests we have, the future guests we have to come on here, share their story. I know we're going to get filled up from it. I know the audience is going to get filled up from it. I think, we're doing something that is going to ultimately uh, provide tons of fulfillment in our life. And I'm just super stoked about it. For sure. Get back right. I had to get back right. Get back right. I had to get back right. Get back right. I had to get back right. Fell off. Lost my cool. Whoa, say. Bounce back. Got dirt on my shoes. Got back right. When you got real power, you can't lose. Fairfax, Monday morning, I don't want to hear trap. I play Rick James when I'm in traffic. I've been doing this since fifth grade. I've been doing this since I've been saved. I've been rock crowds on a big stage. I've been made hits with some big names. Yada, 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 yada. Bought a Mercedes for my baby mama. VIP, rockin' Dolce Gabbana. I went to the Grammys and I took my mama. Bottles on bottles on bottles and models on models on models and dollars on dollars. Yeah, that don't help me when my soul wanna holler and I'm feeling the pain and I'm dealing with drama. Woo! That's too deep. Yeah, guess I better fall back. Nah, get this work. You should have wore a hard hat. They told us don't work in the summer. I told them I